Our speaker was born and went to school in Doylestown. I verified that just today, speaking to his mother. <laughs> and fittingly, his subject tonight is growing up in Doylestown, which he agreed to speak about last April when he received the Bucks County Ambassador Award at the Chamber of, Com of Commerce Lifetime Achievement Awards Program. I'll wait for these two somewhat late covers. I did one of the miss was probably my best lie. He later told me he accepted the invitation because if he didn't, his mother would kill him. <laughs> and mothers, we know, can be very powerful. He said because of his back-breaking schedule, he has to turn down several requests a day for speaking engagements, and he wanted this to be informal, casual, uh, no advanced publicity, and so, as you know, many of you know, we restricted uh, the attendance to our officers and directors and some special guests. We count ourselves very fortunate, his mother aside, to have him uh, talk to us. And again, my apologies about the films. The game was not over. <laughs> Growing up in Doylestown, yes, but he really outgrew Doylestown and Bucks County and became a regional star and now a national media celebrity. If you Google him, you can watch his interview with the president on August 20th, which was the first media interview with the President Granite. He has authored five best-selling books, the latest just off the press called Instinct, the story of the interception of the 20th hijacker, uh, would-be hijacker, by a Puerto Rican <coughs> immigration inspector, and that no doubt prevented even more major destruction than occurred on 9-11. The manager of the uh, Doylestown bookshop, at my request, has ordered in a large supply of the books. Uh, <laughs> it was just published on September 15th, I believe. And he told me the author holds the record of signing some 300 books there in about two hours. We won't ask them to explain that because <laughs> that's not what this program is about. He does a daily radio show from 5 to 9 a.m. and he has often hosted and been on national TV shows. He still keeps his hand in as a lawyer and has a relatively large family. But this evening, much as in our video interviews, our speaker has been asked to talk about his recollections of Doylestown and what it was like to grow up here. He'll speak for 20 to 30 minutes, take a handful of questions, and I'll then recognize uh, a few of our guests. 
I'm delighted to present Michael Smirkanish on Growing Up in Doylestown. <laughs> Thank you very much, Judge. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for, for being here. Truth be told, he left me no choice as to whether I would be here. <laughs> when I would be here, for how long I would speak, and who I would meet afterwards. <laughs> Last night, I was, uh, I was on hardball. This morning from 6 until 9, I hosted the first of two daily radio programs that I do every day. And as had been my goal for the last 10, if not 15 years, uh, I wanted a program in national syndication. I got two. So this morning's program uh, was heard in 15 markets, including Philadelphia, including Savannah, including Atlanta, Monroe, Louisiana. Why all the southern towns? I have no idea. St. Louis and a variety of others. The, uh, the midday program reaches uh, 40 markets. And the midday program is from noon until three, so I spoke for six hours today before coming here. Uh, the midday program is heard in uh, Philadelphia, it's heard in New York City, it's heard in Los Angeles, Indianapolis, Austin, Dallas, etc. I tell you this with only a small degree of braggadocia, some but a small degree. Neither of those programs, nor last night on Hardball, is intimidating for me. This is a bit intimidating <laughs> to come here and, and to walk in and, and to have my father here because whatever stories I may tell, he knows the real version. <laughs> and you know him. He, he may choose to, uh, to tell you otherwise. Uh, but to walk in and to see so many friends is, uh, is a wonderful thing. Karen McElhenney was the first person, uh, Karen Putnam, as I walked in the door, uh, which immediately brings flashbacks. And then to see Tom Scarborough, Back in 1986, the two of us and the field of others ran for the state legislature. I think we still disagree as to which of us Karen favored, but <laughs> we both lost the race. Uh, my margin was 419 votes. I'm not sure about Tom's. I've since located 236 of those people. <laughs> this is my good material, Chuck. <laughs> uh, to prepare to speak, because I, 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 I've spoken often, I speak every day, I speak for a living, and I've, I've addressed many, many subjects in the past, but never this subject. How do you prepare at Judge Ludwig's invitation to talk about growing up in Doylestown? I talked to both of my parents, we reminisced about stories, that was a lot of fun, but in my case, I reached for a photo album. I have always been the family archivist, and it was a great pleasure for me to look at all the old pictures and think about some of the stories of growing up in Doylestown because I, I have always loved this community and have mostly uh, favorable recollections of growing up. You know, there, there, there weren't too many downtimes growing up here. In my case, uh, I was born uh, March 15, the Ides of March of 1962, and I was born at the old Doylestown Hospital. Not the old, old Doylestown Hospital, <laughs> for those who know, but the old Doylestown Hospital. And uh, I came into this world and was taken home to North Garden Apartments on North Street. As a matter of fact, I think the Guardies were, were had, if not, where are the Guardies? If we're not, we're at there. Not that I remember then, I remember the Guardies <laughs> later. Uh, but that was my first address, North Garden Apartments. When my parents moved to Doylestown, coal crackers from the northeastern part of the state, their first home in Doylestown, and this is the subject of some family dispute, was either on top of Barger's or right next door to Barger's. <laughs> Me, all I remember is that if I were home sick from school, it meant chicken salad from Barger's, which if you recall, was a wonderful, wonderful treat. We lived at 24 Mercer Avenue after North Garden Apartments. That was really my home growing up. It's a rare day that I will come to Doylestown without driving down that street and thinking out loud about everyone who lived on Mercer Avenue. It's kind of funny because the Wrigley's were on one side of us and the Shuts were on the other and the McFarland's were across the street and the Haggerty's were on the corner and the Stockles who had the only in-ground swimming pool uh, on Mercer Avenue, hence the name Stockle Valley Country Club, went down the block. They were at 42 Mercer Avenue. And as I was thinking about how I still can picture, I can still remember who lived in every one of those homes, I had a frightening thought and that is 
that today on the main line, and now I understand why David Brenner once said, oh, out on the main line where every other house is missing. I don't know who lives in the house that is too removed from me. I'm not proud of that, but it's such a dichotomy as to what life was like in Doylestown and what life has become for me today, both the good and the bad. The shuts were right next door, and uh, Leroy and Vera Shutt, very formal people. A man who, through the 1970s, was always wearing a bow tie, as my dad will recall. He was also my science teacher, uh, which became uncomfortable because it was in that eighth grade year at Hollycombe that his responsibility was to teach sex education. So here was formal Mr. Shutt next door teaching me sex education. I won't look at any of you when I tell you that I thank God that it was Jim Battelle who was called on to read aloud that day and not me, and he informed the class about the penis and Virginia. I <laughs> 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 the street, and I like to say that we, we lived in the shadow of Fawn Hill. Fawn Hill was at one end of the street, on Mercer Avenue, and Conti's was at the other, at the other end and around the corner. And uh, Fawn Hill and the Mercer Woods, which today I know like the back of my hand because we used to build underground forts throughout the Mercer Woods. But that became a playground of sorts. And Fawn Hill at that time was still inhabited by Mrs. Swain. Remember Mrs. Swain? Mrs. Swain had been granted a life estate by Henry Chapman Mercer. And she was older uh, when we would play there. But, but if, if, you, if you knocked on the door of the castle, and had the right disposition and offered her 50 cents and said that's all you had to your neck, she would take you on a tour. And it's funny because I've since been back with our children to take the formal tour. And I never, of course, tell the, the folks at the, uh, at the, who run it today, uh, but it's nothing like Mrs. Swain's tour. <laughs> Mrs. Swain, and she was famous always for saying, come along, come along, come along. Those were her words. I'll never forget her ushering you along by telling you that. And the highlight of the tour at Fawn Hill was a chest which she told you contained the remains of a pirate, and, and by God, don't open the chest if the pirate may come to life. <laughs> At the other end of the street, Connie's Cross Keys Inn, where my brother worked as a busboy, and it's kind of funny to think about this now because the first lobster I ever tasted was from someone else's plate, at Conti's. <laughs> Someone should order a lobster at Conti's and not touch the tail. He'd bring it home as a busboy, and that became that became a, a late night snack. Uh, there was also the Arctic Market. I don't know if anybody remembers the Arctic Market. I think Dunkin' Donuts is there. It's you know it's funny the way for, for me to, to say to my parents, you know, where am I going? The, the Doylestown Historical Society. And mom said, well, it's on South Main. And I said, well. Is it near Nick Malloy, or is it across from Woolworths, or is it a different place? She said, Woolworths? What are you talking about? <laughs> so when, when I think of, of the locations, I think of the Arctic Market instead of Dunkin' Donuts. I'll never forget uh, when the Philadelphia Eagles drafted a six-foot, eight-inch new wide receiver named Harold Carmichael. And Harold Carmichael made a personal appearance at the Arctic Market. And he was there for a raffle. And the, the raffle that day was won by me. I won't tell you how many I had in the ballot box, but the prize won the preseason tickets to an Eagles Bengals game. And I'll never forget this giant of a man reaching in his pocket and handing me a dime because that's what phone calls cost that we hadn't seen cell phones, so that I could call home and explain to my parents that we were going to see the Eagles because Harold Carmichael had pulled my name out in a raffle. When I was 12, in those same Mercer Woods, I was stung by a bee right here. It was a wasp, actually. And uh, my parents were out, and my neck started to swell. And the Steelman family recognized that this was a real problem and got me to the Doylestown Hospital. They say, just in the nick of time, I had an, aller an allergy. Uh, I was allergic to bee stings. And for the duration of that year of my life, I think it was the third grade, uh, for a solid year, every Wednesday, I'd be dismissed at Doyle early so that I could go see... Clifford Laudenslager, Dr. Laudenslager, <laughs> was the family doctor, and every week he would give me an injection. I also recall getting uh, uh, getting stung before that desensitization had taken place a second time, had the same reaction. This time it was my mother who took me to the ER at the Doylestown Hospital, still the old one, and I remember them telling her that, uh, that if it should happen again and we were away from medical treatment that she should 
Is it my clavicle? Reach here at my clavicle with a steak knife and cut a hole in my throat. <laughs> I, I knew I, 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 I could not get stung for a third time. <laughs> Our house on Mercer Avenue, uh, it, it's funny, I've been back since just knocking on the door and asking if I can walk inside. It was three bedrooms and one bath. We didn't have a shower in that house until the eighth grade. We had a tub, which seems kind of fun. I tell that to our kids now, and they, they find it hard to believe that there wasn't a shower in our bath until the eighth grade. There weren't too many renovation projects that took place at the house, but when they took place, we had an interesting workforce. At the time, my dad was not only teaching school and then a guidance counselor, but he was running the adult education program at the rehab center of the Bucks County Prison. And when inmates were eligible for work release, they would often come and work at our house. So I can tell you, and this was a mystery to me, I didn't know who these people were, but I can tell you that uh, a man named Coleman Foley uh, built our kitchen, and that Mr. Clymer built our basement rec room. And my parents have each uh, often told me about the night, they of course had to drive these men back to their homes at the end of the evening. They have each told me about the night that we drove home, uh, we drove home Mr. Clymer and I remarked on the size of his house as, as well as his family. <laughs> Which also reminds me that on a different day and in a different era, my mother came home from work midday and walked up a staircase at our home and we had a small landing area and then you make a turn and you go up the rest of the way to the bathroom that didn't have the shower. And she looked out the window on our back patio, and there was a man seated there, and he looked like he was wearing a uniform of sorts. She opened the window, and she said, can I help you? And he darted off through the backyard. She called the police. The first question the Doylestown Borough Police wanted to know was, well, how many of them did you see? <laughs> to which she responded, how many of them are there? And they said, well, there are two inmates who have escaped from the Box County Prison. She ran out of the house, and the police had to come and search 24 hours around. <laughs> My father was the disciplinary between the two. Dad had a distinctive whistle. I don't know if he can do it today. I don't know when the last time that he did it was. But at the end of a play day, his piercing whistle from two blocks away because we were often playing sports uh, one street over. That would let you know that it was time to shut down the day and, uh, and come home for dinner. Uh, but don't be fooled, those who know my mother, and I assume that's all of you, mom wielded the yardstick. Her weapon of choice was the yardstick, and we knew where she hid it. We would often hide it from her if we were knew we were in hot water. Let me give you an example. Uh, in the late 1960s, there was a fella in town. I, I, I'm not sure if memory is correct about this. I think it was the Pebble Hill Church with which he was associated. His name was Gordon Drop. Yeah. And, and he was a free spirit of sorts and uh, became somewhat of a mentor to younger people. And Gordon Drock uh, would take control of the coffee house. Well, what I remember is he would take control of the old borough school before it burned. It was a YMCA on the ground floor, and he would have dances on Friday nights. And we had a 66 Chevy Impala in those years. It was, it, was, it was a green Chevy Impala that I can picture now. And I recall that my father was refereeing a football game on a Friday night, and my brother wanted desperately to go to a dance that Gordon Drop was the, uh, the chaperone for at the YMCA. And here was mom, literally in her bathrobe, with me in the back seat, dropping off my brother, who was probably 14, 15 at the time, going to the big dance. And uh, to use her descriptor, when she dropped him off and took a look out the car window, she sized up the crowd and decided they were hoodlums. So she circled the block in the 66 Chevy, pulled back up on the curb, put it in park, left the motor running, grabbed me by the hand, went inside the YMCA in the bathroom, and dragged him out of the room. Mom was the disciplinary. <laughs> My recollection of uh, the center of Doylestown is, a, is a, a Rockwellian image of Doylestown. And I think about how so many towns across the country today you could you'd be blindfolded and go onto a main street and they all look the same. That's not the way that it was in, in the era in which I grew up in Doylestown. For example, I remember that if, if you were talking real estate, it was J. Carroll Malloy. I had the privilege of knowing J. Carroll Malloy. Um, and of course, Nick Malloy, I'm, I'm seeing here now. Real estate, you would think Malloy. 
You would also, by the way, think a guy who used to wear a scarf in the middle of July. You never quite figured out wind chains. <laughs> there was no Starbucks. You know, if you wanted a cup of coffee, you went to Ed's Diner. If you needed printing, you went to Carter Gardy. If it was uh, a pharmacy that you needed, Weiss Bards for drugs. Joe Kenny was the guy who would sell you your book long before there were Barnes and Noble and uh, all the big book chain stores or your concert tickets. Wilson Varco for funeral, Al Buck for hardware, and Meininger's Sports Haven for your athletic year. Which brings me to a, a second raffle story. Meininger's was at the end of our street, and once they too had a raffle, it was for a sailboat. And as luck would have it, I won that one as well. <laughs> this time, having reflected on winning, on winning the Eagles tickets with Harold Carmichael, I was too embarrassed to collect my prize. I called my parents and I asked them if they would please go up to Meiningers and claim it. <laughs> I have watched this town change. Uh, I remember when Burger King replaced a miniature golf. I remember when the courthouse motor inn replaced a farmhouse where we used to play football outside. I remember when Hess's came to the Doylestown Shopping Center, and I believe that I am the only living person who remembers what is now Dairy Queen on North Main, what it was originally built as. <laughs> nope. Burger Chef. Yeah. Burger Chef. <laughs> Just, you know, one of those funny locations that it never, I guess it works now, it works but it now. never seemed to work. You know, you've seen it flip so many different times. Doyle Elementary is where I went to elementary school. Uh, Mr. Larlick drove the bus. Don McClintock, Mr. McClintock was the principal. Mrs. McClintock was the librarian. I, I had spent my preschool years at the Atkinson VFW. And what I remember about preschool at the VFW is that every day there would be a nap time in the middle of the day. And if you dozed off to sleep or convinced your teacher that you dozed off to sleep, they place a star on the card that had your name, and at the end of the marking period, that became your report card. How many stars you have? <laughs> I also remember that when my parents came to the school, I introduced Pop Hines, the janitor, as the principal. <laughs> I had Mrs. Shannon for both first and second grade at Doyle. She was extraordinary. I had Miss Young for third. I had Mr. Reckner for fourth. I remember Mr. Reckner well. Mr. Reckner, uh, his, his heritage was Salvadoran. And on the first day of school, we walked in uh, in Doyle in the North Wing, and he informed the class that he was a bit disappointed as he was beginning the year. I thought, why is our teacher disappointed in us already? Well, he wasn't disappointed in us. He was disappointed in the Central Bucks School Board. And that's because he told us that he had recently made an appeal to them that we should all get on his bus, which was a converted school bus for sleeping purposes, and drive to El Salvador and spend the entire school year on the road. But by golly, they told him we couldn't do it. <laughs> so I went home that night and informed our family at the dinner table of this disappointment. And then my brother, who had Harry Reckner four years earlier, said he told us the same thing. <laughs> uh, I also remember that the fourth grade year was the worst haircut of my life. In Cross Keys near Bard Lynn, there were the five barbers. And the five barbers were our haircut place of choice. I can remember my father would always get the Princeton. So uh, I went in there one day without any supervision, and, and there, was a, there was a particular barber who didn't speak much English. His name was Henry, and Henry gave me the haircut. And when I got home, uh, I looked in the mirror, and at least to, you know, to, to my mind's eye, it was a 45 degree angle for my haircut. At which point, I dialed the five barbers. I asked for Henry, and I informed him that he had just butchered me. Uh, I'll never forget having to walk into Harry Reckner's fourth grade class with that god awful haircut. One of my sons recently thought he had a bad haircut, and I quickly told him the story about the fourth grade at Doyle. I had this better for fifth grade, and Mr. Elwell for sixth. Mr. Elwell was a a first year teacher who had been a track star at Temple. He'd run in the Penn Relays. He was a terrific guy. Uh, oddly enough, when the recent book came out, he came to a book signing of mine. And it was just so overwhelming for me to see Mr. Elwell, who just retired. He had just retired, and here he was, that I was a student of his, of his first class ever. I recall that uh, that sixth grade year was a year when, I, I guess, the, the hormones were active because at recess, Lisa Silverberto would regale us 
by reading aloud from Reader's Digest. Reader's Digest at the time, every month, would have a different part of the anatomy write a column. And I have a vivid recollection of her reading aloud, I am Jane's womb on the Doyle playground. <laughs> 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 There was, a, uh, there was a magic craze in Doylestown in those, in those years, and, and indeed across the country, I think. Doug Henning had done a Broadway show called The Magic Show, and consequently those of us growing up here, and I guess across, we wanted to be magicians. And I took it very seriously. I'll never forget that Mr. Garvey printed for me magician cards, and the magician cards said, uh, had a picture of a magician, Mike Smirkanish, uh, amateur magician, and on the card it said, fee donation. And the other kids all had an interest in magic, but in my case, I would actually go out and do shows, and I kept a diary. And the funniest thing in the world is to go back and to read my recollections of doing magic all over Doylestown, how much I got paid, uh, what tricks functioned and didn't function, and how hostile the crowd was. <laughs> <laughs> Little League then was, was not the travel sport that it's become today. If you played Little League, and, and I did, your games would either, were either in Maplewood or at Community Field. Um, I have a recollection of mom driving us to practice, or pardon me, a tryout one year, stepping up at the plate and hitting a home run over the left field fence. I'll never forget that. Movies were at the county. In one particular summer in the late 70s, I saw Slapshot 10 times because I knew the ticket taker from my class. <laughs> it was also at the County Theater that I became acquainted with streaking. You remember the streaking craze? One night after the Bad New Bears. And I guess I can say this because the statute of limitations has indeed run. It was Kevin Benstead. And Kevin Benstead streaked from the back alley of the county to the old Leatherman and Godshaw across the street and then on up to the Continental Bank. I remember the telephone number for Dominic's, 215-348-9656. Uh, a, because we ordered a lot of pizza. B, because it was a favorite for crank calls. <laughs> we played a lot of street hockey. When the Flyers were hot in the early 70s, we played Nerf football at our bus stop. I had my first radio experience on South Main Street, uh, about two blocks south, and, and, and it didn't occur to me until recently that the first radio experience that I had was right here in Doylestown. The police chief at the time was Chief Tut, and Chief Tut had a, uh, a son named Scott Tut. And Scott Tut, had, he owned Key Records, uh, great buildings up from, from where Malloy is right now, uh, I think it's a Rice, as a matter of fact, uh, location, and he also had a recording studio. And I don't know why, but one day, our, we got the call, and we rounded up kids in the neighborhood to go record a commercial for WBUX at Scott Tut's recording studio on South Main Street. The commercial was for Sylvan Pools. I would legitimately have difficulty telling you what I had for lunch today and certainly dinner last night. But this I remember. Before you take the plunge, be sure you talk to Sylvan. Before you take the plunge, be sure you get the facts. Family engineer for fun and recreation, Sylvan has the pool to keep you all relaxed. So, before you talk to Sylvan, you get the picture. The first radio experience wasn't paid for that one. Uh, speaking of Chief Tut and his son, Scott Tut, I have a recollection of my first political experience ever. That too was in Doylestown, and it was the night that our parents took us to a borough council meeting. I have since asked them, why did we go? Neither has a clear answer. On the agenda that night, and this had to have been the reason, is that Scott Tut wanted to stage a Woodstock-like festival in Doylestown. <laughs> and, and he did. And he did. And I can remember that the night before, we drove uh, the same street, I guess it's West Street, the same street that Doyle was on, and, and there, the, you know, the bypass has since taken the, the, the place of the field where it took place. But I remember, A, watching the debate in Doylestown about whether to permit a rock concert, and B, going and seeing the net effect. We didn't go to summer camp. Our summers were spent uh, at Fanny Chapman, at the Borough Dam. We'd be dropped off and, and asked to spend the entire day uh, in that location. 
At some point, her parents joined the Doylestown Country Club. And so in the summer, that became the spot of choice. And we, again, would be dropped off expecting to spend the entire day uh, at the Doylestown Country Club. I remember one particular day, there was a, a homeowner in close proximity to the country club. There was a creek that separated the Doylestown Country Club from his home, and he had blueberry bushes. And we were forever playing uh, tennis, baseball, and eating the blueberries. And he was livid about it, and he complained to the country club. Well, one thing led to another. Long story short, we were all removed for, for, for because of the blueberry incidents uh, from the country club for three days, as I recall. Nobody told their parents. So the following day, the following day, all the kids, and there were about a dozen of us, got dropped off because that's what we would do every day. We all got dropped off. We all just sort of stood around until I think the Scalides figured out that, uh, that there was a problem. Uh, and then all our parents came and picked us up and grounded us at home. There was a carnival every year behind the Doylestown Shopping Center where Heritage Towers are now. That's where we go for fireworks. My brother was in the first class ever at Hollycom. It, it was brand spanking new. As a matter of fact, I remember his first days of, of school were delayed when Hollycom opened and he was in that initial class. Uh, I remember that the principal was Mr. Hockman and that jeans were a controversy. Seems funny in retrospect then, but you still couldn't wear jeans through that time period. My brother was four years ahead of me. He went to see the East after Hollycom. He had a, uh, a, a skill to throw the football, really had a, a gift at throwing the football, but nevertheless, in his sophomore year, was number four on the depth chart. So uh, these were the days when CB West was dominant. This was the Frank Case uh, era of high school football, and CB East was a perennial loser. And in the week preceding the East-West game, there was a keg party. Uh, and there were a lot of students there from CB East, and the police arrived. The following Monday, football practice, going into the Thanksgiving game, the coach of the football team was Bob Portnick, Coach Portnick. The time is now. They had a slogan, I remember, because we had buttons, and, and uh, I wasn't on the team, of course, but I, I, I would wear my brother's button. Uh, he asked everybody to line up on the goal line, and then instructed everyone who'd been present at the Ken party to take one step forward, and nobody moved. Well, he then pulled out the list of all the attendees because he already knew, and they were all suspended from the team. That included the first, second, and third string quarterback. My brother in his sophomore year now became the starting quarterback for CB East against CB West with 10,000 people watching. <laughs> my favorite part of the story is when I asked him why he hadn't been at the party, and his answer was, because I got bad directions. <laughs> I was leaving Doyle at the time and headed to Hollycom. We were still on Mercer Avenue. I was absolutely miserable because the way they had drawn the lines uh, meant that only six of those who were at Doyle would go together out to Hollycom, traveling by bus six and a half miles. This was the sort of the Doylestown equivalent of busing. Someone had the, 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 the good thought to plan that sooner or later development would come and they would need to build those schools out in Buckingham. But back then, you know, the, the farms still existed, and consequently they needed to bus kids from Doylestown to go out and fill Hollycom. Um, I remember well so many different things that happened in that era, that, uh, that Holly Kong era. First of all, at home, my mother, who had been a secretary at the Bucks County Free Library at Monument Square, Harry Weeks was the fellow who was then running the library, and dad was a guidance counselor, and, and, and mom decided that when the uh, state of Pennsylvania was going to increase the requirement for real estate credits, that uh, it was time for her to take her test. She, She'd completed high school but hadn't gone further, and she'd always had it in the back of her mind that she would get her real estate license. I remember that she was uh, late in turning in the paper, I think because she had butterflies, and that Ed Howard had to intercede. Uh, <laughs> State Senator Ed Howard had to intercede to make sure that she could sit for the test. I also recall that she enrolled in the Schlichter Kratz Real Estate Institute in Lansdale. I don't know if they still exist. And my role, and I, I, I performed it well, was to follow her around the house with this blue, thick book with all sample questions and ask them out loud. And she went, she passed the test. She initially was working with uh, Ed Crawford, best known, I think, for his time and temperature sign, where the, the borough offices uh, are now, and then joined uh, uh, Nick Malloy. Um, I recall as well having my first television experience while at Hollycom. 
I told you that I had my first radio experience on South Main Street. My first television experience was a little bit different. My father got a telephone call one day. He was at UNAMI as a guidance counselor. And at the other end of the phone was Tom Roberts. Mr. Mm -hmm. Roberts was vice principal of Polycom. And he was calling to inform my father that I had uh, exposed myself <laughs> and that I had been suspended from school. And that's the way he expressed it, by the way, that I had, you know, my poor father thought that I dropped trowel coming out of the men's room. <laughs> and that he had a real problem on his hand. What dad didn't know initially was that I flipped the moon in gym class in front of the camera for morning announcements. Polycom <laughs> <laughs> was so sophisticated that morning announcements were on a closed circuit television system. So that every morning you would have the, uh, uh, it may have even been a prayer then, I'm not sure, <laughs> but a flag salute. And, and one day I was in gym class and they were filming a commercial for the upcoming gym show and I thought it would be funny, a little class clownish, if I flipped the moon. And I did and we watched it, but like Nixon, I let the tape stay. <laughs> it, was my, it was my undoing. Uh, my best sports days were, uh, were while I was at, uh, at Hollycom. Um, in my uh, ninth grade year at Hollycom, I, I remember well that uh, our football team was undefeated. We were 5-0 and oh playing Lenape. And Lenape then, you know, Carter Gardy was a standout in playing sports at Lenape at the time. Both pitching, we pitched against each other, Holly Kong and, and, uh, and Lenape, and played football against each other. Lenape was 0-5. We were 5-0. and 0. They were 0-5. And, and it was the last game of the season. And we tied 6-6. Six to six. We were cocky. And they were just cruising to, to give us a bruising. Uh, and it's kind of funny because that team at Hollycom then matured and became, without my presence, the first CB East team to ever beat a CB West team in football. That was my senior year. When I think about my youth in Doylestown, I apologize for getting long-winded. I'm just going to speak for a couple more minutes. Um, when I think about my youth in Doylestown, it, it's often summarized or characterized by work experiences. Because I always worked, I always had jobs. Where Maine meets Union, remember? Where Maine meets Union, which, which was, I think, his stance? Was it his stance? Yeah, yes, okay. and, 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 and there, there was something that, as a kid, I was so terrified of to go into his, his stance, and they had a well inside. I know they had a, a huge hole that you'd look down once you got in that place. It always gave me the creeps. Well, in a later incarnation, it became where Maine meets Union, and Jack McGregor sold women's clothing there. And my first job was literally sweeping the sidewalk for three dollars an hour at where Maine meets Union, and he had a small strip of grass out back, and I would mow the lawn. I was proud to work at McDonald's when they first opened up in Doylestown, and it's funny how things have changed because then we competed to work at McDonald's. Today, there's like a permanent help wanted sign that you have at a McDonald's, and I was thrilled to work there. I was the maintenance man. I didn't have to wear the uniform if I were the maintenance man. And then when they finally changed the rule, they said, you have to wear the uniform. That was the end of me at, at McDonald's. I remember the day that the Mac bus pulled up at McDonald's. We got a call from the Lansdale McDonald's, and they wanted us to know that the Mac bus was in the vicinity. The Mac bus was a nationwide roving bus of supervisors with stopwatches. And they would show up unannounced, and they'd stand in line, and they'd, they'd see how clean is the place, and how long does it take to get your food. I was there when the Mac bus came to Doylestown. I, uh, I delivered flowers for Grouse. I washed dishes at Philip Arthur's. Uh, one summer, I painted street address numbers with Dave McFarland on 5,000 curbs throughout the entire Central Coast <laughs> area. And, and, and for the most part, I worked for the Stockles at Mountain Lake Pool and Patio. They, they really were my employer of choice, and, and Mike and Arlene remain close friends to this day um, and were terrific with me then. Uh, went to CB West, no longer really had the, uh, the athletic talent. I was sort of a, 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 what do they say, a small fish in a, in a big pond. Um, had a good experience and then went on to, uh, to Lehigh and uh, eventually, I, I guess when I think about when did I leave Doylestown, it was probably after running for office in, in 1986. And not with any ill will or bad feeling, but just because I was then in law school and when law school ended, I went in a different direction. I've never left the area. I've always, I've spent my whole life within a 50 mile radius. College at Lehigh, law school downtown uh, at Penn. Um, and now, the funny thing is that we've come back to the area uh, of sorts because my wife and I bought a home in Solbury, and we both 
lead pretty chaotic existences, and this is where we spend our time uh, on weekends. And a large part of the motivation in doing so, at least for me, was to at least in some way recreate for our four children, <coughs> three relatively young sons, 9, 11, and 13, some of those memories that we have, uh, that I have, of Doylestown. I could still take them to the, to the county for a movie. Uh, we can still uh, go out and tube on the Delaware, and we can still go to the Mercer Museum and do the sort of things that I look back uh, fondly and think of. Uh, one thing that you probably don't need to be told because of your involvement in the historical society, but, but to, to leave and to come back is to have a renewed sense of appreciation. To grow up as a young person in Doylestown, I knew it was a wonderful place. I, I knew that I was fortunate to be <coughs> here, but to leave and then to come back is really to say, this is a special place. So. Uh, whenever asked, I, you know, it's always Doylestown that I'll say that, uh, that I'm from for, for all the reasons that I, I try to give you the, the, the snapshot. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to do this. I know I gave you a workout when you said when you come and speak, and I said, geez, I please, I'm so really busy these days. But to me, to uh, think through some of what went on, a real pleasure. Really, really a pleasure. Do you want to handle the questions? Uh, sure. If there are questions, I'd, I'd love to handle them. A few questions. Who will break the ice? <laughs> You don't have to say limited to Doyle's. One right? addendum is the quarter midget racing that went on down oh at the Heritage Oh, yeah. 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 And, you know, on Friday night, the quarter midget racing, uh, I, we would hear that, that thunder uh, right out my back window, as a matter of fact. I absolutely remember that track. We'd go over and ride our bikes. They never liked it, but we would ride our bikes around that track as well. And then go to Cartex and get foam rubber that we would use as golden pads. <laughs> <laughs> but the quarter midget track is worthy of a shout out. Yeah. Anybody else? Michael, you're being very modest about your sports and about your ability. I mean, you did some good things. I love fun here. <laughs> Thank you. Be nice to say Thank you. Painting and reviewing and anecdotal, wonderful autobiography, by the way, was Camcourt, and so you're stuck with it. <laughs> It'll be part of our archives. I don't think we've ever heard a presentation that was really just about spellbinding. And as I looked around the room, everybody was just rapt uh, looking at you and listening to you. So. Many, many thanks. We still have a couple minutes to go here. I want to mention that uh, my councilman and president of council, uh, that Anson is here, a good friend of the society. Let's give him a little applause. Tom Scarborough, who's the vice chair of Northtown Township Board of Supervisors. And he seems to show up uh, at most of our events, and he's most welcome. You're all, of course, uh, distinguished guests, uh, and I would love to introduce, well, some of you, anyhow. <laughs> but instead of that, uh, we have some things for you. Sure. First of all, we have a, a, a tile that was just done by Katja McGurk. How many of you know Katja? She's really, I think, become Doylestown's premier tile maker. Beautiful. And uh, in addition, we have, yeah. by the way, uh, this is Michael's book, Instinct. So you all can rush to the book <laughs> and buy a copy of that. And uh, here is a uh, copy of our book. Perhaps you already have one, called Doylestown, which was published in 2000. And uh, see all these people here? My name is here, and people think I'm one of those people. <laughs> 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 you know, all the uh, uh, most welcome. And uh, I think we have something else here. 
Thank you. Thanks, everyone.